I first heard your story decades ago. I've, uh, I told you last night when we went out to dinner, I've seen pretty much every interview you've ever given. I've followed the story incredibly closely. But for people who don't know the story, let's give them the bullet points. You used to work at Area 51. So to get to Area 51, you have to go to Rachel, Nevada. And right when you get to Rachel, Nevada, drive 1.7 miles, and you're gonna take a right at this stop sign right here. This stop sign. Gonna take a right right onto this uh i guess graveled road and from here i'm not exactly sure but we got to keep driving and then i think the road is going to turn to tar some kind of black i don't know that's what i'm hoping and from there we'll see where we go but you had known about it from the scientific community because it, area 51 at that time was no they still didn't say anything about area 51 okay so they, they just, just said it was in a you know in a remote location and you just know it was up at the test site Right. So, but there was no mention of Area 51 at that time. So they've done hundreds of nuclear tests in Nevada. Nevada, that that whole area was. There's been there's giant chunks of Nevada that people. Yeah, there's a big piece of Nevada, and it's split up into different areas. There's a nuclear test site. There's Area 51. There's the Tonopah test range north of that. There's little sub areas. There's areas where they test chemical weapons and things like that. So it's all broken up as a you know gigantic test area. So take me back to first day on the job. I can't believe we're at the gate of Area 51. This is it. I'm gonna pull over. I just, I feel so awkward if people are gonna just watch us here. The guards. All right, we have to stop and pull over, otherwise we're gonna get shot. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Lazar has remained silent for 30 years until now. He recounts his story to Jeremy Corbell in a new film called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. What, what happened to you? Well, in 1989, I was hired uh, by, uh, actually it was EG&G where I got the job. And it was the Department of Naval Intelligence that actually employed me. And our job was to back engineer an alien spacecraft that was housed at Area S4, which is just south of Area 51. Here's the thing, Matt. When you've told a story for as many years, as many times as he did, mm. it's, uh, it's super hard to be consistent if you're just making everything up. Well, fine, I'll just say everything instead of holding back on anything, yeah. and then you can edit it later on. Right. I had sent resumes to several national labs. I sent resumes out, and one of them went out to Ed Teller and referenced our meeting. I got a response from a couple of them. I went in for an interview. They had a job in mind. And um, went down for an interview probably a couple times. And it was down at uh, EG&G Special Project. Uh, actually, it was EG&G where I got the job. It's super hard to, to, to have things that you're saying back then that everybody says don't even exist. Right eventually turn out to be true. The thing that we're most interested in is, is duplicating the, the reactors without using this element 115, uh, which is of course impossible. They were trying to, uh, and there have been projects before that, uh, just trying to use a, a normal nuclear generator fueled with plutonium, and um, it's really a futile attempt. It's very difficult to deny that. Like these are yeah. parts of his initial story. His initial story had something to do with this thing called Element 115, which uh, most people, I mean, they didn't even recognize that it actually existed until much later, right? That's a big feature of it. So at the time, you having a firm knowledge of the periodic chart and knowing what was real and what wasn't real, what was your reaction to having this stable element 115 that wasn't even supposed to exist well everything was impossible right i mean down down to the metal i i did get a chance uh to look inside the craft on only one occasion so you're going into this craft and what are you thinking when you're inside of it like what are you seeing it's um it's a very ominous feeling because it's there are no, first of all, everything is one color. It's like a dark pewter color. And there are no right angles anywhere. It's as if somebody took, a, I've said this before, somebody took a, a model out of, 
and fashioned it out of wax and then heated it just for a short time so everything melted. Everything looks like it's fused together. Everything has a radius of curvature where two uh, items meet. It's, uh, it's a really weird looking thing. But um, uh, there was almost nothing other than a small foldable hatchway that, um, that looked recognizable. Everything was, uh, was really unworldly to pick on it, <laughs> a way to describe it. So you, you get inside this thing, and it's designed for something that's much smaller than a human being. Yeah, you can't really stand up till you get to the very center of and it. And how tall are you? I'm 5'10". And what do you think this was designed for? I'd say something close to half my height. Wow. Are there pictures of this crap? Well, there were. I did have, after I left the project, I did still know some of the test flight times. So there were several occasions that I did tell friends about it secretly, and we drove out to the desert and at night and filmed some of the test flights. So it was far away. Test, but, did it fly? Oh, yeah. If you don't know how it worked, how were you able to fly? How were you able to fly it? Well, you know, my analogy to that is you can get a, a motorcycle and drop it off in Victoria Times with the keys in it. Now, given time, they'll play around with it, push buttons, eventually turn the key, and over time they'll be proficient at driving it and using it. But once it runs out of fuel, it's going to stop working, and when it comes right down to it, that can't even fabricate a plastic fender on the thing. It doesn't seem like a liar. Seems like he's very intelligent. I mean, when he's talking about all kinds of different things, very intelligent. So either he's running the greatest 30-year con of all time, <laughs> or maybe this really did happen. When you talk to him, so you're just guessing. You don't know. I don't, right. know, I don't know his life. I don't know his real life, right? Just guessing. But he seems like a guy who's seen some shit and, and just didn't know what to do and told some friends about it and then then went to the news and that's what that george knapp guy who was the investigative journalist that studied this case over all the years like this guy's never wavered like and he's th stuck with the story and over and, and over things have shown to be true that they said were science fiction and then they continued questioning me mainly on my interests outside of work they seem to be really concerned about that about things like jet cars. Right. What do you do in your spare time? Uh, you know, you, you say you work on little projects. I said, yeah, I have a particle accelerator in my master bedroom and, and things of that sort. And uh, some time went by and they called me back in. They said uh, there was a, a senior staff physicist that was leaving uh, this organization and they basically interviewed me for that job. So they told you about this stuff in 1982? Yeah, well, no, we kind of... What, what year was this? 19... It was 80, 88 and 89. So 88, 89, they told you about this stuff. So this was not like... No, they didn't, they didn't tell me about it. That's one of the things that this group came up with. Mm. The... Um, um, God, I keep losing my train of thought with this thing. So this one area, this, this element 115 was the fuel. Yeah, it was the fuel. Um... The, the world will forgive you for having a migraine. I, can I just <laughs> it's really hard one, to think through this. Just give me a minute. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. They're looking for some of the fuel from the craft that might have been stolen. What happened? <laughs> Jeremy and I had a private conversation out in a remote area of my property. Cell phones in our pockets, but turned off. All filmed. And filming it. And um, Jeremy was down there to film some of this documentary. He left the following morning, and simultaneously there was an FBI raid at my place A of raid. business. raid? Yeah. Looking for what? Well, they said they were looking for uh, some receipts from uh, an individual that might have bought some toxic material from a company. But they came with more people than you could really think would even fit in our building. I mean, they, they were able to repeat back verbatim a portion of the conversation that we thought were, was private, and that shocked us because we were joking that nobody even cared 30 years later what he says. 
but apparently it's not as it appears. There were 25, 27 forensic agents with a truck there. Security agents from the OFI, the Office of Federal Investigation, had been witnessed doing random security checks at his house. There was almost no question in anyone's mind, anyone in, in Bob's immediate life who, who talked with him on the telephone that his phone was tapped. I mean, strange things would happen on Bob's phone and really continue to this day. How had the craft gotten there? That I don't know. I mean, my own gut feeling was it was more of an archaeological type find. But um, I really have no information on how they originated there. Broken, I've got it all broken. I would love to go past this, but I can't. But, I mean, just look at this. Warning, military installation. Off limits to unauthorized personnel. Dude, you don't mess with this. Yeah. A sign for no drones. Man, this is crazy. And when you see this craft and you're inside, was there any indication that there was an area that they would use to control it, to pilot it? Was there a pilot seat? Was there? There were three seats. They sat around uh, the. Reactor was in the dead center of it, and then equidistant around there were three seats. So and was... that's all. The, there was a, a large, you would, they're not consoles, they're large rectangular objects, also spaced equidistant around the center. Um, there's nothing on them, there's no buttons, there's no lights, there's and no controls. And they look the same color, the same? Every 